students, judges, are we ready? On behalf of the Brewer Foundation and New York University, welcome to the 21st Annual International Public Policy Forum Semifinals. My name is Andrea Sadberry and I'm the IPPF Executive Director. The IPPF is the only competition that gives high school students around the world the opportunity to engage in written and oral debates on issues of public policy. This year, more than 120 teams, representing schools in 11 countries and 22 U.S. states, submitted qualifying round essays on the topic resolved. On balance, the hegemony of the United States dollar is detrimental to the world economy. Judges determined the top 64 teams who entered into a written debate tournament, volleying papers back and forth via email. This process continued for several rounds until the Elite Eight teams were named. Seven of the eight teams are with us here in New York, while Team Singapore competed virtually this morning from Singapore. The quarterfinal competitions were, her, well, were held earlier this morning. At this time, we'll begin the first semifinal debate with Pine Richland High School from Gibsonia, Pennsylvania, competing against Amity Regional High School from Woodbridge, Connecticut. At this time, I'd like to allow the debaters to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Miles Brown. I'll be first speaker. Hi, everyone. I'm Amish Sethi. I'll be the second speaker for the affirmative. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Nee, and I'll be the third speaker. Hi, everybody. My name is Melinda Liu, and I will be the first speaker on Amity Regional High School. Good morning. My name is Annie Liu. I will be the second speaker for Amity Regional High School. Hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Liu. I will be the rebuttal or third speaker for Amity Regional High School on side negative. We have a big round of applause to our student debaters. We'll now to introduce our moderators and judges. Serving as our moderator for this debate is Mr. David Baker, who is the Director of Admissions at St. Mark's School of Texas in Dallas. Prior to that, he coached debate and taught public speaking for 16 years. Under his direction, the St. Mark's debate program was named one of the 10 most successful programs in the 20th century. Mr. Baker worked with the Brewer Foundation to develop this international competition and currently leads the IPPF's Topic Selection Committee. Our semifinal judges include Mr. Will Baker, who is director of the NYU Global Debate Program housed at the Leonard N. Stern School of Business. He also serves as chief information officer for Baker Consulting Associates based in Dallas, Texas. BCA's past clients include the Open Society Institute, Deutsche Bank, the Brooklyn Public Library, and the Committee of Religious NGOs at the United Nations. As a student at Cornell University, Mr. Baker won over 100 speech and debate awards and was named a Vinifee Wilson Scholar, the team's highest student honor. After Cornell, Mr. Baker worked at the International Association for Religious Freedom before becoming a social entrepreneur. He founded both the New York Urban Debate League and the Malcolm X Prison Debate Initiative at Rikers Island. In 2003, as head of NYU's policy debate team, Mr. Baker became the first African-American director to win the national championship since Melvin Tolson of Wiley College in 1935. Since then, Mr. Baker has overseen top national finishes for nearly 20 years in a row. His team was honored with the 2022 National Public Debate Award by the Cross-Examination Debate Association. The award annually recognizes the team, well, this year, the team recognized the team for his work with the Brewer Foundation and other partners to share the transformative power of debate worldwide. Mr. Baker is a member of the IPPF Advisory Board. Mr. Andrew Garbarino is a PhD student in Hebrew Bible at Princeton Theological Seminary. His research applies historical and literary criticism to texts from the ancient Levant, focusing especially on the aesthetics of biblical and cognate poetry. He is also an ordained minister in the Reformed Church in America. Mr. Garbarino was a member of the 2008 and 2009 IPPF championship team from Bel Air High School in Houston, Texas. According to Mr. Garbarino, the research, writing, and critical thinking he learned participating in the IPPF continues to serve him today. Mr. Alex Pui is the Chief Financial Officer of Zone Europe for the world's largest brewer, Anheuser-Busch InBev. He is based in Brussels, Belgium. Mr. Pui has financial experience ranging from treasury, trade, regula trade relations, and currency markets to business planning and control and tax. Mr. Pui's geographic scope in his current role ranges from Russia, Ukraine to Western Europe. 
Mr. Pui was an award-winning high school debater at the Alexander W. Dreyfus Jr. School of the Arts in Florida. With his help, the school won the IPPF in 2006 and 2007. Mr. Pui now leads the IPPF Circle of Champions, an IPPF alumni organization. He is also currently a member of the IPPF Advisory Board. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our judges and moderator. Finally, a quick reminder to please mute or turn off your cell phones. And with that, I will turn things over to Mr. David Baker. Thank you very much, Andrea. We'll get started right away. We will begin with opening statements by both sides, beginning with the affirmative for a period of eight minutes. All right, awesome. Uh, before I begin, just everyone hear me? Is that good? OK. I want to give a series of thank yous, uh, for in particular, first to uh, our amazing teammates, Callie, Tig, and Matthew. They're not currently on stage right now, but uh, their ability to help us with the essay over these past nine months has not only made us significantly better as a team, but just an overall very helpful and very fun experience. So thank you very much. Next on to our coach, Mr. Baiko. He has been a debate coach for over six years and an English teacher for four years. Incredibly amazing for all three of us. We've had an opportunity not just to improve our English skills and critically thinking, but uh, better enjoy the uh, art of debate. Uh, the third, I guess I'd, I'd give it to my parents and all of our parents in general for being very patient with the long, long nights we've had um, in each other's houses um, working on this. So thank you very much to them, um, those of you who watch at home. And then finally, to the Brewer Foundation. Um, COVID-19 has been not the best for debate in high school with digital tournaments and everything. So the opportunity to not only come to New York City and debate in the Council on Foreign Relations headquarters, but do it on all expenses paid has been very helpful and incredibly fun. So thank you so much. It's a great way to end our senior year. So thank you. Um, all right, so with all of the thank yous in order, I will begin. As World War II concluded, 44 allied nations convened in Bretton Woods to create a new international monetary system. From this agreement, the US dollar emerged as the dominant currency of the global economy. 78 years later, the global economy has now completely transformed, while the dollar's dominance over it hasn't. The world economy now finds itself over-reliant on the undue influence of the dollar that harms global stability and security. And because of this, Amish, Andrew, and I affirm, on balance, the hegemony of the United States dollar is detrimental to the world economy. First, we would like to define dollar hegemony as the dominance of the dollar in the world economy through its role as the global reserve currency, the medium of international exchange in the euro dollar system. Second, we have one key observation. Given the on-balance qualifier in the resolution, the burden of the affirmative is to prove that the harms of dollar hegemony outweigh the benefits to the world economy. A comparison to an alternative system is not necessary to prove that the dollar is on balance detrimental. Moving on to our first contention, the euro dollar. Currently, the Federal Reserve finds that the dollar makes up 80% of international trade and 60% of global foreign reserves. However, a majority of these dollars transactions internationally are not under the control of the Federal Reserve. Thus, to understand the dollar in the context of the world economy, we must look to how it is used globally, the euro dollar system. Simply put, the euro dollar system is a dollar deposits and transactions in which a country outside the US banking system. Foreign banks can create offshore dollar loans and derivatives. However, this creates dollar liabilities through IOUs that the banks can't issue base money for. Instead, the collateral remains in the US. This is crucial as the euro dollar market is the largest source of global finance by a wide margin. NetBank 16 estimates the euro dollar market is the size of $14 trillion. And according to Thai Finance 21, it is estimated that over 90% of international trade and 90% of international loans are financed using the euro dollar. Unfortunately, because the euro dollar system is completely unregulated, it creates a devastating credit multiplier. Vanderbilt 14 finds, because physical dollars never leave the US, the collateral remains in America. Because euro dollars rely on an IOU system and are not subject to reserve requirements, a mere transfer of $1,000 can lead to thousands of additional euro dollar assets and liabilities being created on foreign ba bank balance sheets. The collateral remains in the US, but bank loans out euro dollars to each other unbacked by collateral, creating a credit multiplier. In the end, although these assets and liabilities theoretically cancel out, in practice, if just one of these banks fails, the entire chain of IOUs collapse. Vanderbilt 14 continues, the lack of euro dollar oversight directly contributed to the scale of the 2008 recession. When the US housing market collapsed, European banks had a US dollar funding gap of between $1 trillion and $6.5 trillion. Foreign banks didn't have the liquidity to back euro dollar liabilities and the global market collapsed. In the end, the United Nations found that 14 million jobs were lost in the developed world. While the 2008 recession reveals how harmful such economic crises have been, we are in store for much worse. Dollar hegemony multiplies the risk of every recession causing them to globalize. The impact is poverty. Vanderbilt 14 explains that over-leveraging the euro dollar threatens global stability. Going on to say, euro dollars have the potential to 
export what in a less integrated market would be damaging only to a single country or sector. With the euro dollar, though, a run on a single currency could trigger bank crunch around the world. Bradford 13 terminalizes that the next global economic shock could push over 900 million people into poverty. Moving on to contention two, dollar loans. Under the current system of dollar hegemony, nations are over-reliant on dollar-denominated loans. Indeed, the National Bureau of Economic Research finds 80% of cross-border loans to emerging markets are denominated in dollars. This generates instability for emerging markets because when the dollar appreciates, payments on dollar-denominated loans increase, making it more difficult to service. Dollar hegemony is detrimental as emerging markets have no other option than dollar loans, meaning even slight fluctuations in dollar value directly affect these nations. A study by the Bank of International Settlements between 1990 and 2020 found that for every 1% increase in the value of the dollar, it depressed growth aspects by over 0.3% in emerging markets. This is critical, as the dollar uniquely appreciates the most out of all major currencies, especially during times of crisis. Research from the University of Cambridge explains, because the dollar is a global reserve during global economic crises, dollar liquidity becomes scarce when dollar demand is high, causing sharp appreciation against emerging market currencies. During COVID-19, for example, the dollar appreciated over 15%, leading to far greater debt burdens on developing nations and causing significant harm to the global economy. Ultimately, because the dollar is the only option in the status quo, the Bank for International Settlements finds appreciations of other safe haven currencies do not have the same negative effects of emerging market economy growth compared to the dollar. The impact is a debt crisis. Historically, the 1980s Latin American debt crisis started when the U.S. increased interest rates to control domestic inflation, while completely disregarding global ramifications. This led to sharp dollar appreciation, meaning countries had to pay more to service their debt, ultimately forcing Latin America countries to default. The Institute for Latin American Studies finds that debt payments quadrupled from $12 billion to $66 billion in 1982, and according to Britannica, Latin America's total foreign debt increased by 1,000%. Ultimately, the debt crisis caused by dollar hegemony revealed to a decade of progress lost in Latin America, now known as the lost decade. Moving on to contention three, sanctions. Dollar hegemony provides the US with the ability to unilaterally sanction countries with uniquely devastating results to their economies. Hui 18 explains that America's power stems from the dollar's dominance of the SWIFT system, an electronic currency messaging system with over 30 million transactions made each day, 40% of which are in the dollar. The Economist states, America is uniquely well positioned to use financial warfare in the service of foreign policy. Due to this power afforded by currency hegemony, America does not have to rely on coordinated economic sanctions with other nations. Instead, American leadership can enact damaging sanctions for economic gain. This abuse of power is best exemplified by America's ongoing struggle with Iran. In 2018, when President Donald Trump pulled out of the JCPOA, an anti-nuclear Iranian deal, other European countries in Iran wanted to remain in the deal and stop further economic warfare. But, as Evis 18 finds, Trump used dollar hegemony to force SWIFT into removing all Iranian banks from its platform. The impact is a humanitarian crisis. The BBC found that Iranian's economy shank shrunk by over 4.8% after the re-imposition of sanctions. Furthermore, Rasmapur 19 finds that some small businesses in the country saw sales drop as much as 60% due to these new sanctions. In total, Viet 21 finds that Trump's sanctions have furthered a humanitarian crisis. Because of dollar hegemony, European businesses would be prohibited from doing business with Iran as these transactions would require the dollar. This has led to mass shortage of food, medical supplies, and other equipment in Iran, causing infant mortality to double and pushing 3.7 million people into poverty. All of this economic strife came with no political success. As Murphy 22 finds, Iran is now on tack to create a nuclear weapon despite the sanctions. And ultimately, the US has undue unilateral influence because of the dollar hegemony, allows them to devastate communities and people around the world. For these reasons, we affirm. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have the opening statement from the negative for a period not to exceed eight minutes. You may begin. Okay, first, um, before I begin my speech, I'd like to give a few thank yous. Thank you so much to our team. Um, thank you so much to Pine Ridgeland for being here today and debating with us. And also thank you so much to the uh, other members of our team that are on the stage with us today. And also I'd like to say thank you so much to our sh amazing advisors and chaperones, Mr. Shamp and Mr. Will. And also I'd like to say thank you so much to our lovely debate coach, Everett Rutan, who has helped us throughout this competition and has guided and supported us. And now I will start my speech and my time begins now. So one thing we wanna emphasize on side negative is that USR hegemony is an interconnected system and what hegemony is, is leadership. Dollar hegemony is leadership, which means that nations are cooperating with each other with the US 
being the leader at the top of this. The dollar is what the U.S. controls, and the dollar is something that all nations control because the U.S. works cooperatively with others and acts as a leader and leads other countries and takes the opinions and voices of others in order to lead the world's economy into growth. And why is this helpful? It's because the U.S. dollar as a leader, it has... Can, it can consider everybody's say in everything, but it can also impose regulations to ensure that the global economy is on the right track. It can make these regulations on people like the EU, on people like other liberal international organizations to make sure that the world's economy is growing at a steady rate. And we can see this in first my speech, which I will be analyzing. We will first go into the refutations that our opponents bring up, and then we will go into our affirmative or our negative contentions. So first, their argument about the euro dollar. They argue that the euro dollar, that the US is reliant on the euro dollar, and the power of the US dollar is to rely on the euro dollar, and that's very detrimental for the world's economy. However, they fail to realize that, as you stated, hegemony is cooperation. Hegemony is leadership. When we have the world around us, it means that we need to make sure that we're considering the opinions of all people. And the fact that the US dollar is actually ha having the EU and having these euro dollar dollars in, in their economy shows that the US is acting as a good leader who's helping and including the opinions of all people within the system. And additionally, it also has regulations. For example, it has the Fed has recently proposed changes to FR24220, which actually increases euro dollar market coverage, meaning that the US has regulations on these markets and makes sure that it considers everybody's opinion while also having regulations to make sure that the world's economy is stable and make sure the world's economy is growing at a steady rate. Additionally, into their second argument, they talk about dollar loans and how the over-reliance on dollars is very detrimental to countries. However, this reliance is non-unique because developing nations need foreign capital. They need these loans in order to develop their own economies, and without this, they will be unable to develop and their people are left in poverty. How can a country who is poor develop if they have no money? Where do they get this money? They get it from developed nations who can actually fund this growth. And with the US dollar hegemony, it is not the over-reliance on dollars, it's the fact that the US provides this service so that countries around the world can grow. And they also talk about, in their sanctions argument, they say that, the U.S. has disproportionate effect, and it causes detrimental effects on, um, on people in these countries and can lead to poverty. But the fact is, they bring up the Iran, the example of Iran. However, Iran is a bad actor, and we can all agree that people on the world stage know that Iran is a bad actor because in the U.N., they have multilateral sanctions on this country. And the fact that they have multilateral sanctions shows that people across the world, people across different countries understand that Iran is the bad actor, Iran is the one at fault, and the fact that the US is stepping up to make sure that these punishments are being in place for people who are harming the world economy is good because you want to make sure that everybody in the world economy is on a level playing field, that everybody in the world economy is fair, and that everybody has the chance to grow and develop. And now we will be going into our contentions. Our first contention is that the US dollar hegemony provides the necessary framework for global prosperity. There are two things that the US dollar hegemony provides. First, it provides trade. When you have trade, any nation that needs to develop uses trade to make sure that their economy is growing. And if you're a trading party, you want to use a stable and reliable currency so that your trade can be profitable to you and the rest of the parties you're engaging with. So the US dollar provides this service. And by doing this, nations across the world in different emerging markets can engage in trade because they know investors will actually come to their markets if they use the US dollar. And in terms of foreign direct investment, nations need investment from other countries, as I mentioned before. And the US dollar provides this investment because countries know that since I'm using the dollar, I will get my investment back. And I'll make sure that with the services the US has created, such as the IMF, World Bank, and WTO, that they will get the effective loans that they put in. Now on to our second contention, that the US dollar hegemony has caused this growth in the past to both developed and developing economies. As you can see, it is indisputable that global prosperity has increased over the past few years under US dollar hegemony. Global poverty has decreased 33.9%, and the GDP per capita has increased $8,000 since the 1980s. And this has been seen in both developing and developed nations with in developing nations, it has increased times five, and in developed nations, it has increased times six since the 1980s. And on our third contention, it is that the US dollar 
has all these factors that incentivizes people to continue to use the dollar. And there are three reasons for this. The first reason is that the US can resolve crises effectively. For example, in the 2008 crisis, the U.S. instituted swap lines to countries like Brazil, Mexico, and Japan to make sure that these countries could alleviate the economic burdens that they were facing. And this is really important because during the 2008 crisis, even with what our opponent talks about with the EU and the euro dollar, the U.S. was able to step in. The Fed was able to step in and make sure that the economy was on the right track to provide the necessary resources for everybody in the world's economy to flourish and make sure that even if there was this in the past, that in the future, we will be able to alleviate these things. And for example, in the COVID-19 crisis, these swap lines were continued and the U.S. continued to have these swap lines to nine, and they added nine central banks to have this permanent swap line to make sure that everybody in the world's economy was able to get the growth and the investment that they needed. And the second factor is that the U.S. dollar hegemony has an open and fair economy. When the US has an open and fair economy, it means that it has the lowest tariff rate in the world at 1.6%, and it is openly available. The fact that we have been writing these essays, the fact that we have been using all these statistics shows that the US publicly publishes all its data and it's open for scrutiny. And anybody can contribute their concerns to the world's economy, and everybody can talk about what they think should be changed and have an active voice in this public policy making. And our third, factor that we want to outline is that the U.S. dollar hegemony has a fair and rules-based system. The U.S. has founded the IMF, the WTO, and World Bank, and is a very great contributor to all these organizations. It is one of the greatest funders of all these world organizations, and the fact that the U.S. implements these shows that it supports a rules-based economy that is very fair to everybody who wants to participate, and it's fair in making sure it sets the stage for global growth. And additionally, the fact that the U.S. has all these different connections with other countries makes sure that the U.S. and its network of allies and the network in the U.N. and NATO makes sure that the U.S. is able to support everybody within the global economy. And for this reason, we'd like to vote for a side negative ballot. Thank you. We'll have a 90-second break. Hmm. The end of the preparation time will now have the now we will teach the timekeeper how to turn it off is what we'll do okay so cancel there we go farm to speech for five minutes you may begin when you're ready all righty so let's begin now <laughs> 
Let's start with the very first thing that my opponents say. They tell you that the U.S. is a leader, meaning that they keep into account what everyone else says and do what they do to promote the uh, benefits in the global economy. Two key issues here. Number one, they say that the U.S. is a leader without giving any examples or evidence as to how. What you see instead is what the negative argues, or the affirmative argues, which is that the U.S. will always promote its domestic economy's interests over the rest of the world. For example, we can see this with the Latin American debt crisis. Because of a rise in inflation and oil prices, the U.S. increased interest rates domestically. The issue is when you increase interest rates domestically, it leads to appreci appreciation abroad. This is what uniquely caused a 30% appreciation of the dollar currency and a quadrupling of the debt in Latin America, which caused a debt crisis, which reversed a decade of progress in Latin America. The theme here is simple. The US inherently, because it's a nation, will prioritize itself and its selfish interests come at the cost of the rest of the world. Now, let's go on to some of their responses to our case. So first, they say that the euro dollar system is good because it shows that we're incorporating the rest of the world, but they're ignoring our fundamental links. We are telling you that with the euro dollar system, it is based on flawed economics, where nations are transacting IOUs without actual backing in the US. For example, when two nations are trading, there's, a, uh, there's liabilities that aren't actually backed by the Fed, which creates a dollar funding gap. This gap means the dollars are being transacted that aren't actually in the Federal Reserve, which, creates, which generates instability. Their only response to this is that the Fed is, quote, proposing changes. The issue is regulations have never actually been put in place. The euro dollar system has been there for decades, and you haven't seen a single regulation that they talk about happen. Now, let's go into their response to their second contention, where they're telling you that developing nations need loans. We agree, but having only one currency to take loans from is not good. Once again, return to the Latin American debt crisis. When there's only one currency on the market, that means that entire nation is at the whim of the United States. So if the US is appreciating, their loans increase in value and make it harder to pay back. In a world where there are more options and not just one currency, nations can still get loans, but they get it at, with greater availability and don't have to be at the whim of one currency. Now, let's move on to their response to our third contention. Their only response is that the Iran is inherently a bad actor. The issue is they ignore our specific link about the JCPOA. We agree that Iran is usually a bad actor, but we put in the ag agreement to, for them to stop building nuclear weapons, which everyone, including the EU, supported. The issue is when Trump was elected as president, he pulled out of this deal that we made just a couple years prior. And this is without support from other EU nations. What this means is one key theme is clear. The US is also an unstable actor because of shifts in political parties, and as a result, it should not have all the power that a hegemony grants it. Let's respond to their case now. Let's start off with their first contention about the U.S. being a necessary for global prosperity and trade. The question I ask my opponents is what makes the U.S. dollar uniquely beneficial for trade? They don't explain why and only give one reason of like the U.S. is the most stable currency. The issue is that research from EPN Journal finds that the Swiss franc is actually more safer and other currencies, including the euro, yen, the Swedish corona, these are all more stable, as stable, if not more stable than the dollar. My opponents fail to answer why these nations can't also be used in trade and why the USD is uniquely the most stable and beneficial for trade. So you can drop that contention there. But second, you actually turn this argument because the stability that they talk about is actually an illusion. In fact, the uh, dollars are not that stable because the dollar status means it appreciates significantly during times of crisis. The dollar appreciates as nations, uh, there's greater demand for the dollar in types of crisis, which led to appreciate 15% during COVID alone. As a result, what you're seeing is the stability that they talk about doesn't actually exist. There's just over-reliance on one currency, which when it fluctuates, leads to harms on the rest of the world. Additionally, you can turn this argument because the euro dollar itself takes out this concept of stability that they talk about. 90% of all interna international transactions are under the euro dollar system, which, which aren't actually regulated by the Fed. So the stability that they talk about may apply for a small portion of dollars, but for the vast majority, it doesn't exist. Now, let's move on to their second contention about the poverty rate decreasing. The big, biggest issue here is that it's correlation, not causation. They don't prove to you why the dollar uniquely was responsible for these decreases in poverty throughout the years. I would argue industrialization and globalization, other things are more responsible for this drop in poverty. But second, you turn this argument because without the dollar, there'd be an even greater reduction in poverty. Remember the Latin American debt crisis, where the USD's appreciation uniquely reversed a decade-long progress of growth in Latin America. So I would argue the poverty rate would be even lower without it. And finally, on their third contention, in which the USD is benevolent, I'd once again respond to Iran and Cuba, where the US sanctioned nations without support from the rest of the nations.
In fact, for a UN, uh, UN resolution to end sanctions, 184 nations support it with only two voting to keep sanctions in place, the US and Israel. The US acts against the rest of the world's interests and is overall harmful to the world economy. Ninety seconds. That's time. Okay. Negative for five minutes. Everyone ready? Time starting in three, two, one. In 75 years of dollar hegemony, GDP has increased, inflation has decreased, poverty has decreased, and millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. It is inarguable that the dollar hegemony has not only not caused detriment, but benefits the world autonomy, regardless of what affirmative says. For this reason, Amity is proud to negate this resolution. All right, so I'm going, to start, I'm going to start off by observing that there are four main issues in this debate. Firstly, the euro dollar, the US stability and leadership regarding dollarization and EMEs, the correlation and causation with our arguments, and lastly, sanctions. So I'll be going through each of these in turn. I'm going to start with U.S. civilian leadership because I think this is really the crux of the round as hegemony as leadership, and we should win if we prove this point correct, but we'll still go through all the other issues. So, firstly, they talked about how the U.S. is not necessarily unique as a lower reserve currency. However, the, the fact that people choose to use, a, use the dollar every single day, and the use of dollar every day is really a vote for the dollar every single day. So they talked about how other countries can use other currencies, such as the Swiss, Corona, and Euro, but the fact that countries willingly choose to use the dollar and not these other currencies indicates that the dollar is the most trusted currency, is the most stable currency, and the currency that best suits other countries' needs. Again, there are also some other reasons why countries use the dollar that we have cited numerous times in our contentions, such as the, such such as the dollar, um, such as the U.S.'s fair legal system, such as the U.S.'s transparency, its accountability, and other factors. But we also want to talk about the U.S.'s ability to cooperate with other countries. For example, the U.S. dollar hegemony involves U.S. leadership and organizations such as the IMF, the World Bank, etc., which allows for coordinated policy making that is quick and effective. The U.S. is also has one of the largest economies in the world, and no other countries have sufficient liquidity or the same extent of use as the dollar. They talked about how uh, the dollar leads to over-reliance and how uh, dollar, dollar loans are bad for other countries. They call it reliance, but we call it the U.S. being an effective lender of last resort for economies in desperate need of aid. They blame dollarization for issues with different countries, but dollarization has only failed when countries have failed to maintain strict economic policies. For example, Argentina devalued the peso after dollarization, which undid the effects of dollarization. Dollarization has been effective in reducing the inflation of currencies bef before they failed to maintain those economic policies. Additionally, current Again, countries such as EMEs choose to use the dollar because it is the most stable. Our opponent tried to make the argument that the U.S. is not necessarily as stable as other currencies, but we note that the U.S. is uniquely the most stable currency uh, to use as a global reserve, as indicated by the widespread use of the dollar, and certainly by uh, the U.S. stability in T-bonds or treasury bonds, which are virtually free of credit rate risk, which is why the U.S. dollar is commonly seen as a safe haven for investors. 
All right, so in response to our third contention, our, our second contention, which is that the U.S. dollar hegemony has benefited both developing and developed economies, our opponents say that this is correlation and not causation, and they give some other examples of industrializ industrialization and globalization benefiting the world economy, and we're not arguing that the U.S. is the sole factor that promotes growth. Of course, there are other factors that contribute to the growth of the world economy, but the U.S.'s rule-based system, which accounts for transparency, accountability, and uh, has a fair legal system, creates an environment where growth under all of these factors is possible, while these factors on their own do not guarantee growth, not having them certainly inhibits growth. Additionally, US dollar as a reserve currency makes trading cheaper and more efficient, which then facilitates globalization and the spread of technology and innovation that they cite as factors for the improvement of the world economy. Therefore, the US dollar hegemony is the primary factor in this regard. All right, so now moving on to sanctions, which is a direct parallel between our their contention of the US is a benevolent global steward and their their contention of sanctions. So again, they only cite examples of bad actors. Iran and Cuba are both bad actors. And th the issue here is that because they, these countries are have been committing significant human rights violations, the US has to punish, punish them to in indicate that we don't approve of their actions and of human rights violations, right? So we see that the US really only has three options in this scenario, right? So the, so the U.S. can either not act, the U.S., which is essentially tantamount to encouraging these countries to continue with their human rights violations, to continue enacting countless abuses and countless crimes against humanity, or the U.S. can use military force, which then leads to greater bloodshed, greater harms, greater harms to basically everyone and lives and the world autonomy, or the U.S. can impose sanctions. And they talk about how these sanctions are unilateral and aren't supported by other countries, but we have evidence to the contrary. For example, sanctions on Iran were supported by the U.N., the EU, and Canada sanctions, and uh, the, since other countries imposed sanctions on 25 corporations, Spades and people linked to Iran support from militant uh, networks. And they talked about how uh, sanctions are uniquely detrimental to dollar hegemony because of the involvement in SWIFT. And we want to turn this point. They talked about how um, because the fact that the majority of nations use SWIFT, the majority of nations use the dollar, which makes the dollar so dangerous or powerful, means that countries trust the dollar to be an effective system. All right, so lastly, I want to talk about dollar, uh, the euro dollar. The main issue with the euro dollar is that it isn't regulated, which creates liabilities that cannot be overseen. But we give examples of the US regulation. For example, US branches of foreign banking organizations are required to report euro dollar borrowing. That is an example of regulation that has been in place. The Fed has also collected from US-based brokers euro, euro dollar data since 2010. And we also want to note that hegemony and US leader, hegemony and leadership does not stand alone. That's time. All right, thank you. I strongly urge an end of ballot. Start the team cross examination period at this point uh, for 12 minutes. Captains, if you'll help me out by making sure things are distributed the way they should be. We'll start with a question by the affirmative to the negative. All right, uh, I can take the first question. So when you guys talk about your dollar, your two main responses are regulation and the solution of swap lines. But I guess my question is, if we're seeing a $6.5 trillion funding gap between what the dollars actually have and the euro dollar system, then wouldn't you agree this regulation isn't working and the solution of swap lines is just a response to a problem that the US dollar hegemony is already creating? So to start off with this, um, I think this mainly goes to your point about like speculation. But the thing is like, if we look at like the stock markets today, for example, or taking this as an analogy, the thing is like, in finance, everything is in fact like speculation. Because for example, if you put money into the stock market, that money is not like really guaranteed to you unless you take it out. For the euro dollar, it's similar. It's like the fact that people believe in it, and for example, if I have a paper dollar bill, this paper dollar bill has value if I believe in its value. If people believe in the euro dollar's value and people trust the United States in maintaining US dollar hegemony, that means that they believe in the US dollar's value and having this belief in the value creates this stability. And this is important because it kind of like mitigates this funding gap you're talking about. Because if people believe in it and people believe and see the value, the actual value is what their perceived value is. Question from the negative to the affirmative, please. So a lot of your case centers around this idea of the euro dollar and it causing global. Uh, a lot of your case centers around the idea of the euro dollar and it causing global crisis. But you don't really directly link this to all the massive harms you cite. How exactly does, is the euro dollar the primary cause of these concerns? Yeah. So dollar hegemony creates euro dollars, and euro dollars are outside of the control of the Federal Reserve. There's zero regulations. You guys say they propose regulations or they have to keep track of like loans, but in reality, there's no actual reserve requirements in countries outside of the U.S. 
on euro dollars, which means they're effectively unregulated. This was problematic because this led to a $7 trillion funding gap of euro dollars, meaning that they couldn't pay back the dollar liabilities that they had in the United States, which is what led to the scale of the 08 recession. It exported what have been a local crisis into more of a global crisis because of the over-reliance on the dollar. Question from the affirmative to the negative. Negative needs to be someone who has an answer. Yeah, so, so I'd like to ask about sanctions. So let's talk about sanctions in Cuba. We've had those in place for 60 years. They've achieved no political success. They've caused a humanitarian crisis where 26% of Cubans are living in poverty, or 1.2, 11.2 million people. And overall, every single nation other than Israel wants us to end the sanctions. Is the US being a good leader by keeping these sanctions in place? Answer from the negative. Someone who hasn't answered yet. We don't yet. contend that sanctions could have harms on the global economy, but the problem is that the majority of sanctions that we are discussing are multilateral in nature, and the U.S. is the leadership in, in these like organizations that is leading these sanctions. And given that there are always going to be bad actors and that there is an international consensus that these actors need to be checked, we believe sanctions are the best option. Question from the negative to the affirmative, someone who hasn't asked a question yet. All right, so our opponents claim that dollarization is an effective policy, wait, sorry. Sorry, can, can we start? Uh, is dollarization U.S. policy or specifically supported by the U.S. government? Could you, could could you, repeat, you repeat, repeat the question? question? Is dollarization U.S. policy or specifically supported by the U.S. government? No. All right. Question from the affirmative. To the negatives, please. All right, so let's go back to sanctions really quickly. We agree with you that multilateral sanctions are a good thing. Wouldn't you agree that dollar hegemony uniquely enables bad unilateral sanctions from the U.S.? Should be one person who has an answer to question yet, and that person should answer this one. Hi, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so you said in your last speech that most sanctions are multilateral, which we agree with. Would you agree that dollar hegemony uniquely enables unilateral sanctions, harmful unilateral sanctions by the U.S.? All sanctions, or sorry, all countries are capable of implementing unilateral sanctions. However, you have never explained why the dollar hegemony specifically has an incentive to impose unilateral sanctions. You simply say that the U.S. has the capacity to abuse unilateral sanctions, and the U.S. simply has the ability to impose unilateral sanctions. But the U.S. really has no incentive to do so, and you have not made this link chain. Question from the negative to the affirmative, someone who hasn't yet asked. All right, so insofar as there are more stable currencies. Oh, wait, sorry. Okay, I can ask the question then. So you talk about, um, or like countries adopting the US dollars and the Latin American crises. So do you think that based on like, for example, if we take Argentina, in 1991 to 2001, um, their inflation rate was around 171.67%. 100, 100, and 1998, uh, after they dollarized for around three years, it was 0.92% in inflation. Do you think that having adopted the dollar for the Argentinians, like, currency stability was a good thing? Uh, I can respond to that. So I think it's interesting we chose 1991 to start that year because the whole decade before that, they saw aggressive inflation because directly of the U.S. dollar and inflation, um, and inflation due to the Latin American debt crisis. And then if we look to the current status quo, after they've dollarized, they've seen a significant, um, almost tripling in their debt right now because of the fact that the dollar appreciates during the COVID-19 pandemic. Question from the affirmative for the negative. All right, so given that... There are many other currencies like the euro, yen, Swiss franc that are more stable than the dollars. Why is global trade uniquely driven by the dollar? I want to turn this question um, around. So if there are so many other alternatives to the US dollar, why haven't, why haven't countries started using these alternatives? Why, are the majority of, why is the majority of trade still done in SWIFT and in dollars? It's because of dollar hegemony. That's what we're arguing. In a world without dollar hegemony, you'd see more diversification of trade. In the status quo, you would agree we have dollar hegemony, right? Yes, which and is that's... because of the people's trust in the dollar. No, so the, the reason dollar hegemony comes is for a couple reasons. You could take it back to like Bretton Woods, where we adopted the U.S. as the global reserve. And I'd say that's the biggest reason why we have dollar hegemony, the fact that it's the reserve currency in most nations. What, what, the negatives argue, what the affirmative is arguing for is that A, it's not good, but B, the world without dollar hegemony would be one in which it was never put in place, so you wouldn't see this over-reliance on it today. Question from the negative for the affirmative. Uh, may I ask a series of questions? Uh, no. Someone else needs to ask the question. 
Okay. okay, I can ask. So you talk about how it started out with Bretton Woods, but don't you agree that after like the U.S. unhooked from the gold standard, that the U.S. dollar hegemony was never officially declared the reserve currency, and it was only called the de facto reserve currency? Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, but the spillover effects from dollar hegemony exist to this day. So if dollar hegemony started in 1944, the only major system we saw in change was the collapse of the Brentwood system, with the main carryover effect being dollar hegemony still existed. So yes, we are on a fiat currency right now, but with the global reserve currency being under the dollar system, this just never hasn't really changed. Um, this I would also argue that dollar hegemony is decreasing right now. For example, the dollar's hold in reserves is 60%, the lowest it's been like since dollar hegemony. So you're saying that people are choosing the dollar. I'd say people are starting to turn away from the dollar and the status quo. Question from the affirmative to the negative. Yeah, so uh, you guys mentioned that we don't show a link chain from unilateral, it's not in our interest to unilaterally sanction a nation, but how do you respond to the fact that with Iran, we'd already created a nuclear deal that benefited the world economy and also stopped nuclear proliferation, but then Donald Trump thought it was in his political interest to pull out of the deal, which in turn led to creation of nuclear weapons and also a detriment to the Iranian economy. Daniel, why don't you take that one? Yeah. So I think, again, that is one specific example, and there are general... There's still that general consensus, and even given that like idea of the JCPOA agreement, there's also the problem that Iran is an interna international sponsor of terrorism, and that in itself is a problem, problem that the U.S. feels it should address. If I'd like to add also, um, that was like only one president in the U.S. history. That's Donald Trump. However, when Biden took, the, took back the U.S. president, he, he tried to renegotiate with Iran. Question from the affirmative to the negative. I'm sorry, from the negative to the affirmative. It can be any of you. Um, sure. So you, your, sec oh, your second contention relies on the idea of dollar loans. However, given that in, uh, alter in the absence of dollar hegemony, there is still likely going to be a dominant currency. How, is, how are these problems any like, different in your world? So I would say in the absence of dollar hegemony, there's not going to be one currency. It'd be more spread out. And I think that's what we argue is uniquely good. Whenever you're over-reliant on one single currency, that means that nation is reliant on the policies of that nation. For example, when U.S. appreciates their own currency, that means that the debt increase in value, which is uniquely harmful. When there's no one nation, there's no same over-reliance. So I'd argue you don't see the same impacts. Question from the affirmative to the negative. So could I ask this one? Let's right. have Andrew ask it. All right. So... On appreciation for dollar loans, as we were discussing, wouldn't you agree, as long as you're relying on one currency, you're more subject to fluctuations of that one currency than if you diversified it into multiple currencies? Anybody? Uh, okay. I think the problem with that analysis is, sure, um, like the currency could fluctuate, but isn't that this that's not unique to uh, the dollar? All currencies fluctuate, and our point is that the dollar is relatively stable to other currencies. You need to prove that this is a significant harm specifically to the dollar. Question from the negative to the affirmative. All right, so I want to return to a question we were asking earlier. Uh, the country, ten, the country that uh, different countries borrow from is purely the choice of that of that country. If the U.S. dollar is so damaging, as you say, why don't different countries borrow from the euro, RMB, yuan, etc.? Yeah, so that current, those currencies are not currently as available as the U.S. dollar simply because of the fact that dollar hegemony exists by its definition. And I'd also argue to the status quo, we are actually seeing a decrease as in more people are taking out borrowing from the renminbi, the yen, the euro, as dollar hegemony is at its lowest point in all of its history. Question from the affirmative to the negative. Yeah, so I want to go back to something you said earlier. You said Trump was the only example of like U.S. like pulling out of the JCPO, POA and then it coming back to Biden and he's trying to renegotiate it. My main question to you is wouldn't you agree that it's bad that the our foreign policy and the global economy is dependent on like fluctuations in political party if we can just like see randomly bad actors coming up? So the main manager of the U.S.'s monetary policy is actually the Federal Reserve, which is independent from politics and the government. The U.S. actually established the Federal Reserve in 1907 because the U.S. recognized that we could not entangle uh, monetary policy with private enterprises. So we repeat this argument with that. Okay. We're, we don't have time for another question or answer. Thank you very much. I think we're all even on questions and answers. So we will then move to the questions from our... Uh, from our judges, try to keep these balanced, agree that we can, need to, I'll direct them, but would rather stay out of it. So you have 20 minutes, gentlemen. Question from the panel. Sure. I don't know if I need to push, I think. 30 minutes. All right. 
Um, <laughs> I have a question um, to start off here with uh, with the negative. Um, you know, you've argued that the current world order is preserved by the fact that people can sanction um, using, uh, you know, the dollar hegemony kind of as a, as a unifying force. Um, is there a potential issue that the people that are taking the decisions to sanction um, are part of one world order and that there's another world order that's growing that doesn't necessarily want to play by the same rules? And so you potentially have actors like China, Russia, uh, India, um, that would love to sanction the US for its actions, you know, keeping people on an island without giving them any charges and parading them around in orange you know, jumpsuits with bags over their heads, might not necessarily be seen as the most human right thing to do. So I guess my question for you is, you're preserving kind of the existing world order by uh, supporting dollar hegemony. Um, doesn't that come potentially with uh, an inability to sanction a bad actor, which could be the US? I think, first, on the idea that like, the US could be in the wrong, there is the, there's the concept of like, transparency and the fact that as a global hegemon, the U.S. is open to a lot of international scrutiny. It's constantly on the international stage. And therefore, when the U.S. maybe does a unilateral sanction or breaches the code of conduct based on this international rules-based system it espouses, it is held accountable because other nations, not only those in that circle like China, Russia, etc., but also its allies like Great Britain would criticize these actions because there's generally a consensus of what is right and wrong on the global stage. And I think this is also important because the notion of a rules-based system is uniquely a result of dollar hegemony, given that you need rules to preserve order. Without rules, chaos would ensue, anarchy would ensue, and there would be no like general guidelines for nations to follow. There would be no conduct on what is actually right, what is wrong, and which is actually necessary for international stability as a whole. Questions in the panel? I really want to follow up on that, but I'll resist for now. Uh, you all are really throwing around the $7 trillion number and kind of enjoying that. So, But I, I need you to answer the, the essential question from the NEG, which is, OK, we get it. Those are obviously problematic. What are the ultimate impacts of those? And what's the internal link to those internal impacts? So the link to that impact is that because there's this dollar funding gap because they're not actually backed by actual cash reserves, those remain in the US and they can't be exported around the globe. It creates a dollar shortage during <coughs> times of crisis, which is what led to the scale of the 08 recession. We're arguing that the 08 recession would not nearly have been as big without this over-reliance on a single currency that's not backed up by anything. There's no leadership over the euro dollar system. And that's what led to 14 million people eventually going into poverty. Um, I have a question for both teams um, in turn. And why don't we um, start with the affirmative, or the negative. Um, so there's been a sort of implicit debate, although it hasn't been very directly clashing. And I want to clarify, because I think potentially there isn't clash on this topic. Um, but you talk about hegemony as leadership. And then you guys defend hegemony as dollar hegemony. I'm not really clear on how those are different. So could you please clarify in your mind, if you do think that you clash with the affirmative, how your definition of leadership is different? And same for you guys, like how are you different than them? So we really think that the clash that we, we kind of have is that we view hegemony as a neutral concept. We view hegemony as leadership and on side affirmative, they view hegemony as dominance and which is something bad for the world's economy. And the reason why we view hegemony as leadership is because the US as the head and as the person who founded the IMF, WTO and all these rules-based organizations has fostered global cooperation and has fostered kind of like this agreement among different countries to make sure that the U.S. is one, considering the opinions of all under a fair system, but also making sure that it has regulations in place so that if there are bad actions taken, that there are consequences to these bad actions. However, on side affirmative, they only state that the U.S. is 
dominating, and that's a bad thing because they only point to specific examples. So two things I would say to that. Number one, we want to clarify that when the, we look at the resolution, it focuses specifically on USD hegemony. So we're not considering leadership in other aspects, such as like free, it's like large democracy, things like that. We're only looking at the currency specifically. But second, we would clash in another key area. We agree, we define leadership as dominance. And my opponents, they say that it comes with these other aspects, such as like cooperation and listening to everyone. We believe that hegemony doesn't, or leadership doesn't inherently imply that the U.S. is a good actor who like listens to everyone and maintains cooperation. We believe that's a burden that they have to prove to show that the U.S. is a good leader. So sure, we agree with leadership as dominance, but there can be good and bad leaders, and I think they have the burden to show that the things that they talk about actually happen, and it's not just inherent to any leader. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask a follow-up, and just give me a yes or no answer, and and if you say no, then give me in the rebuttal like what the answer is. I don't want to hear right now. But it sounds like from those answers, there's not clash on the framework. Like you agree that U.S. hegemony is leadership through dollar hegemony, like yeah. the resolution. Yes. It yes. just you disagree on whether it's good or bad. Exactly. Okay. 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 Yeah. okay. Great. Question from the panel. Do make me go this time? All right. It, implicit in the next argument is the notion that if country X doesn't like the hospitality of the US, they have more than enough adequate other options that they could go to. But it's just because the US is so wonderful uh, that they're choosing to uh, rely on the, on, on the US. I guess my question is, does that mean that the negative will defend or believes the notion that alternative currency options are equally available? In other words, if I am country X and I'm going out, it's not that there's uh, so much more available of the U.S. and there are, 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 are opportunities to get other loans and other support in other currencies, but in fact, is that like uh, we just love going to the U.S. first? So I want to clarify, this is not an argument that we are making, but an argument we want to address in the affirmative case. They are saying that the US dollar is not unique and that different currencies such as the Swiss, Corona, and Euro are similar. We believe that this is not true. We believe the dollar is uniquely suited to leadership and to being the hegemon. Rather, we are trying to clarify that their argument that any that any turn, that any any uh, other currency would be just as good as the US and that people should rather switch to these other currencies. We completely disagree on that notion. We believe that dollar hegemony is the best for the world as a whole. Right. No, I understand that you all support the notion that that, that dollar hegemony is, is, mm -hmm. is fancy, lovely, and the greatest thing, you know, since sliced bread. I guess my question is coming at the second level of the choice matrix that results from that. So in the world of the NEG, my question is, if I do not prefer that currency as a, na um, as a nation, do I have the same level of available alternatives or not? I understand that your argument is that the U.S. should be best. My argument is, are the alternatives available in the square or not uh, in the world of the neg? We think that we think that countries are available to choose or invest in other currencies and to hold other currencies as foreign reserves at their uh, discretion. But we believe that countries choose the U.S. dollar. So we, yes, we are saying that alternatives exist, but we do not think that they are equal on any level. Now, the reason why I'm asking the neg that is because you all are making several arguments about currency availability, but again, we're not getting that clash between the two sides related to that. So what do you all think are the ramifications related to currency availability and those alternatives in the squo in terms of how it functions now? Right, so to qualify this argument, I think we have to understand that as with the turn of the 21st century, with a lot of major things, we're seeing a shift in where the world market is focused and where the reserve currencies are. So in the 20th century, it made sense that dollar hegemony was dominant because the U.S. was a major superpower and it was still relying on the Bretton Woods system. Now in the 2020s with the rise of China, Russia, these other major economies, we are seeing now the effects of what countries actually want when they're choosing it. Uh, we have a set, just in 2022, it is at an all-time low for global reserve currencies, the U.S. dollar, at just 59%. So when we ask ourselves, what do countries actually want, we are seeing a slow transition away from dollar hegemony in an attempt to, one, balance the fact that a complete shift would be unstable to the economy, while at the same time be trying to diversify allocations, and at the same time ensuring a more multi-currency multi and less dollar hegemonic world. That seems, sorry to say, I'm maybe my question for the affirmative is, that seems more dangerous in a way, um, because if you don't have, let's say, a unified um, central organization to apply economic um, uh, sticks that potentially um, you'll see people resort more towards interventionism and military interventionism. So going back to the Iran example, 
well, imagine we're not in a world where they can cripple the currency uh, markets and ultimately restrict Iran from, from accessing global trade and creating a contraction in Iran. Well, then maybe the reaction instead is, well, let's just you know, put in some military bodies and ultimately bomb them, which is what you're seeing between Russia and Ukraine. They can't do anything economically, so they'll just go in and put some people. Yeah. Is that what you're advocating for? A world more full of interventionism and back to the good old days of you know, guns and, and bombs versus the period of what I see kind of as a co correlation, maybe not causation, but more stability uh, uh, after, uh, after the world wars. Right, so economic turns could still occur and would still occur without dollar hegemony because of the simple fact that multilateral sanctions exist. When we see bad actors act on the world stage, we see a unified response, not because of US leadership, because it's in the world's interest to do so. Take the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we see countries uh, multilaterally sanctioning against countries. Um, with Iran specifically, initially, before the JCP or anything, it was a multilateral sanctions that would have existed with or without dollar hegemony. What we're saying is unique to dollar hegemony is America's ability to unilaterally punish nations for their own political gain. Uh, we see the rest of the world trying to fight this with deals and economic cooperation, while well, the United States, for a domestic benefit, is punishing the rest of the global economy. Uh, also to build off the point, I think you talked about uh, a, a, a chaos or greater lack of central centrality um, in a multipolar world. I would say we don't see that centrality now, or at least one that's beneficial for the world economy. I think when we look to the Latin American crisis, what we see, decrease of the 1980s, is we see that the Federal Reserve is not reliable for the rest of the world. Its sole responsibility is the U.S. And when the U.S.'s um, intentions and benefits don't align with the world, they side with the U.S. And with it, uh, I believe the global economy is hurt. So um, thank you. Uh, I have a, I actually have another question for the AF, but I'm going to ask the NAG and hope, give me some more time to ask an AF question, sure. please. Other, other judges? Okay. So um, quick question about how you think that Euro dollar is not a big deal and specifically like how could it be regulated? I understand it's not being right now, but how could it be regulated and okay, how could it be so solved? Yeah. I'll take this issue. I think one problem with what the affirmative has brought up is that they, they provide a tenuous link between the idea of euro dollars and crises. We think that if this was an extremely big concern, we would see more significant crises on the global stage and that the world economy wouldn't on net still be growing. And furthermore, we think that the idea of the euro dollar could still be held accountable is because, again, U.S. leadership is not only U.S. in isolation, but based on coalition. And because this coalition okay, is okay. based... I'm sorry. No, keep going. Sorry. Uh, because this coalition is based on shared interests, shared ideologies, these nations would work together with the U.S. to facilitate proper policy implementation, cooperation, etc. Because the euro is representative of the European Union, they share the same interests in, in the U.S. in general. Of course, they might have a few disagreements, but in general, when they have disagreements, they work to settle them, and in general, they have a shared interest, and they work towards it. Uh, I was going to go ahead and ask the affirmative a question, but Andrew, suddenly my mind's gone blank. What, did you happen to have a question that you wanted to ask? I did. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm so glad that just worked out. Um, okay, you, you used like, the word like, <laughs> USD um, appreciation a lot, but you didn't ever mention USD depreciation. So like, how would you address the argument that, well, sometimes the USD depreciates and all of a sudden Latin America owes less money? Yeah, so what's really key with appreciation is when it happens, and that's what the uniqueness is. So what our evidence specifically tells you is it's during times of crisis that the USD appreciates. And this is because whenever we're in a session, demand for dollars goes up, while there's usually monetary contractions to so supply decreases. So what you see is the, UFD incre the US increases interest rates, and USD appreciates during times of crisis, such as during coronavirus, during 08. So it's when the appreciation happens, not just that it happens. That's really important. Questions from the panel? Okay. You have more questions? I just have one more to check in, but Do it. I'll have to side down on that. I am good. Neg, let's get down to brass tacks for a sec. Uh, what's your biggest impact that you feel the AF is mishandling horribly in this debate? Okay, I can respond to that argument. So I think the biggest um, 
kind of like impacts that the negative is missing is the fact that the U.S. dollar is a good or the U.S. dollar hegemony is a good leader. The fact that the U.S. has like these systems set up such as the IMF, WTO and World Bank shows that the U.S. is willing to cooperate. And the fact that they allow the euro to control some of its currency shows that the U.S. believes in its and puts its trust into other countries currencies and showing that they're not just this abusive one person. They're a good leader who is able to kind of like pull the interests of everybody else in the world and able to work with other people. After you, you can take door number one or door number two. You can either say, yes, in fact, we did address that X way or the same question. You know, what is your biggest impact that you feel they have uh, mishandled? I think we'll go for the second question. And I think the biggest impact they mishandle is Latin America. Because that's the biggest area in the round, because it reversed a decade of progress just because of dollar appreciation. And that fits really well with our theme. We have one instance of appreciation due to the over-reliance on the USD, on the world, global economy, caused a decade of reversal of progress and growth in Latin America. So it shows how one currency is too much and can uh, cause harm from one small instance. F question. Um, one argument that you make, and don't squirrel and make another argument. Well, I didn't, it didn't make sense to me. Um, you said, like, in a world without U.S. dollar hegemony, somehow countries will have a greater availability to loans. And I'm just curious, like, why does the denomination that loans are given in matter to the availability of them? Like, why would it be easy? That, that's what I understood. And maybe the answer is that's not what you were trying to say. So. So that's, we're not saying greater availability of loans. Okay. Our argument is that whenever loans are dominated in different currencies, it's not as reliant on one nation such as the U.S., which one appreciates leads to as much harm. So it's not availability, it's diversity is what we're yeah, going but, for. Yeah, but like the IMF like loans people money in dollars and, and like, you know, Germany can, like you're arguing like, the whole euro dollar thing, right? Like, so I think specifically for IMF loans, they're actually not in majority in dollar. They're in special drawing rights, which are yeah. basket currencies, including the dollar. But what we see is their option for loans is multi-currency because they believe they're the most stable. And that is what we believe in a multi-currency world would be more prevalent. Yeah, I think the IMF SDRs are a good indicator of what our world would look like or more towards that. Uh, just a clarification. So, um, so how did they get the loans, the developing countries? Who, who, who brokered those loans in, the, in, in this basket of, of currencies? The IMF. Okay, and um, how did the IMF get its funding? From multiple organizations. The US only makes up 20% of the funding, and while that is significant, the IMF would exist with or without dollar hegemony, as in it's in the interest of the world to stabilize the global economy. So we find that China's providing, Europe's providing, all these major actors are funding the IMF to support it. So special drawing rights are indicative of a larger, broader viewership. And even if the US might have created the International Monetary Fund, it is used and relies upon international cooperation um, to support its economy. And when China loans using the One Belt, One Road mm -hmm. system in Africa or other countries, uh, do you know what currency they use? To I believe they're mainly denominated in the renminbi. Now, one thing that's troubled me during this debate is one of the things you said right at the beginning, which is that the affirmative has no burden to provide any alternative mm -hmm. whatsoever. Um, and I'm a little bit struggling with that because um, I believe that the world order that the negative here is offering to say that U.S. leadership, creation of, the I, creation of the IMF, hosting of the IMF, I think in all of the presidencies of the IMF, they've all been uh, 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 you know, Western leaders, um, that all came thanks to, to dollar hegemony. And that you're saying, actually, you know, the other alternative is that other currencies can fill its place. And in, I would make the connection to say that this one belt, one road, renminbi, type loans offer that opportunity. But then I kind of feel like we're going to go down that route of, well, actually, wait a second. Those also have problems. And ultimately, we're going to get back to the current status quo. Um, so actually, you know, whether you use the dollar or the renminbi or any other currency, you're going to have these same type of systemic problems. So my question to you, essentially, is if you're very happy with the IMF that was almost created on this world order, where do, we go, where do we go from here? I know you don't want to talk about alternatives, but I want to talk about alternatives. So how do I balance, how do I balance that? 
Okay, so the reason we say we don't need to compare to an alternative is kind of along your line of reasoning, is that two systems can be simultaneously detrimental. The alternative can be detrimental, and the dollar hegemony can be detrimental. One might be slightly less detrimental, but that doesn't mean both aren't still detrimental on balance for the world economy, because they generate more harms. But if we want to look at like a more different system, I guess, from the IMF, we would say that was like economic hegemony that drove the IMF to creation, not necessarily that the currency, because the currency for the IMF is in special drawing rights distributed across multiple countries, and that's how globalization has trended over time. It's been diversified into multiple countries when it started as the USD, so we're seeing a transition away from hegemony. It'd be nice if we had something for that. Yeah, it was 30 minutes. <laughs> Wait, are you serious? Go ahead, make fun of me. <laughs> right. uh, okay, great. Well, I, I, I can't, I mean, if I have an opportunity to talk. Um, uh, the, uh, so I, I, I do want to hear your answer to this argument, which was made uh, by the affirmative, which is, so the United States, you know, is, you say is a good leader and is cooperative, but how would you account for the fact that U.S. politics are incentivized based on U.S. voters? Right, so they're, you know, Germany and Latin America aren't electing the president. So how do you respond to the fact that, doesn't that incentivize US policy to be selfish? Okay, so I think this kind of goes back to a transparency point. Sure, the US is obviously held accountable by its voters, but the voters also have an interest through the news, like, like hearing things about the war in Ukraine, to pressure bad actors like Russia, to ensure that the US is maintaining its global credibility, to maintain the US's status as a democratic nation that supports a rules-based democratic and liberal order. I want to add that the U.S. also has, it's also in the interest of the U.S. to support its allies and the uh, global internet autonomy and the world order as a whole because that directly does back and benefits the U.S. autonomy and the, uh, citizens in the United States. So we believe that like U.S. policymakers and people at the top of the chain are still going to enact policies in the interest of other countries because the U.S. has many allies abroad and other foreign countries. And we have talked about how the Federal Reserve is independent from the, uh, from the government and from politics most, for the most part. Questions from the panel? A little bit lopsided toward the affirmative. There's a question for the negative that would get us on track. Yeah, maybe just a, a clarification. The, the, the affirmative basically says that the percentage of reserves that are held in dollars is constantly declining um, and reaching its lowest level. Um, so I guess my question is, then why, why is that happening? Um, the reason is because under U.S. dollar hegemony, the rest of the world is growing. The fact that the U.S. established this system in the beginning is that it allows for other countries to grow. So, for example, if the U.S. has a piece of, like, say, a pie chart, then as the rest of the world's economy continues to grow under dollar hegemony, more countries can garner a piece of that pie. So essentially that the U.S. is still growing, but in terms of like the relative standpoint, other countries are also growing, so that the US is a benevolent leader because it is allowing other countries to also grow their economies, even if the US, um, US's power on a relative scale is declining. I want to add that the US as a highly developed economy has less, it's easier for an economy to catch up than for the leading economy to grow faster, which is why other countries have just started growing more quickly than the US, which is also directly a result of US dollar hegemony, fostering direct investment in emerging market economies and countries that are still growing. There are three or four inevitability claims that lead from that, and I don't think you meant all of them, so just let me just check a couple of things. In other words, you're saying dollar hegemony is shrinking now relatively, even in a world in which uh, the U.S. Uh, is continuing to advance or just advancing slower because they have further to, they don't have as far to go as other countries are that, that are smaller. But will you defend that there is a level at which we still need dollar hedge to remain larger? because obviously that seems like it would be important to, you know, the neg in this debate. Yeah, so I can respond to that. So there is a certain level because as a leader, you need to make sure that you have the ability to support everybody in your economy. If you don't have a big enough economy, you can't support hegemony. But the U.S. still has one of the leading economies in the world. And the fact that it has this means that it can support others. And even if it 
has like less of a percentage of the pie, as we stated earlier, it still has the majority in like, for example, IMF SDR allocation. Uh, just a quick note. Again, hegemony is not in isolation. Because the U.S. working in allies, if you consider the liberal international order as a whole, that makes up around 42% of global, like, I think it was global GDP. And this means that that's a considerable chunk of the global economy. And that chunk of nations represent a lot of their interests aligned with those of the U.S. And we think that even if the U.S.'s share of the pie is necessarily declining, the pie is getting bigger, and the U.S. is not alone. Since the aff affirmative said that this was the biggest impact, and they called you, you pointed to Latin America. Um, I want to. I guess I'll start with you, and then we'll ask the negative to respond. Is tell me the story of Argentina. You know, in forty-five seconds, that that fits your view of what happened. In Argentina, yeah, specifically, crisis? yeah, yeah. So I just want to quickly point out: we both try to say like the dollar is good. We say that it's bad for investment. They say it's good for investment. I think we're the only side that gives specific examples. We can look specifically to Latin America and Argentina. One of them. What happened is that the U.S. Uh, they took all their loans in the U.S. dollar because the dollar is a hegemonic currency, and that means that when uh, it was due to oil price shocks, we increased interest rates, which led to appreciation of the dollar. The value on their debt quadrupled, and it made it impossible to pay back, and led them to default on their debt, which reversed a decade-long uh, economic growth and led to a what's called the lost decade in Latin America. Okay, so to respond to that, uh, so we we want to first respond to the first observation. We think that it is more important to talk about the general trend of dollar hegemony in its entire breadth, but we can also talk in specific examples. So let's talk about Argentina. So in 1991 and 2001, the Argentina dollarites, and during this period, in 1991, their inflation rate was 171.67%. In 1988, it went down to 0.92%. And then again, so Argentina was doing well under dollarization, right? So the only reason why dollar, the, the impacts that they uh, caused that they talked about occurred was because the, the Argentina relaxed restrictions on the peso and on their own currency. They devalued the peso to make Argentinian exports more competitive, right? So this is them going off of dollarization and like loosening up their strict economic policies. And that is when they developed it on their US dollar debt, and that is why their inflation is now soaring higher. Tell me the story of Iran in your words and then in your words. Like, what, what, why was the U.S. dollar hegemony you know, good for Iran? Uh, is this years? connected to the idea of sanctions, exactly? Or yeah, right, exactly. What you've been talking about we're, we're going yeah, in the debate, right. yeah. All right, so the story of Iran is that because of, like, decreased relationships following, like, the Iran hostage crisis and other things and the rise of, like... Oh, sorry, you don't have to start there, but just <laughs> you can start with, like, the sanction stuff that started with Bush and, you know... All, okay, yeah. so I think the sanctions was there was a general... <laughs> There was a general global push to prevent nuclear proliferation in Iran, as well as the fact that the international community recognized Iran's support of terrorist groups like Hezbollah. And therefore, the, the like previous administrations under the United States have been part of a multilateral effort to promote policy uh, like that would deter Iran nuclear proliferation. And following that, with the change of presidency, Trump decided, um, after the treaty was already implemented, JCPOA, Trump decided to re-implement sanctions for, um, for reasons regarding Iranian support of terrorism, not necessarily the idea of nuclear proliferation, and that is what the other side is emphasizing. Yeah, so I think with the story, the split occurs in 2018, because before that, you have what exists in a hegemonic or multipolar world, which is multilateral sanctions of nations working together to punish a bad actor. But in 2018, we see the detriments of USD hegemony. What are those exactly? Well, because the US has a domination over the SWIFT financial market, we're able to unilaterally force SWIFT to pull out of a nuclear deal that benefited the economy and went directly against what our other allies wanted. Almost every single other nation other than Israel supported the idea of staying in the JCPOA. But Donald Trump did that directly for one key reason, which was it was a campaign promise and went directly against Barack Obama and his political opponents of the time period. So the biggest issue with dollar hegemony is that multilateral sanctions exist in either world. The idea that countries can work together to sanction bad actors will exist. But the danger of dollar hegemony is when there's a political incentive for an actor such as Donald Trump, the Federal Reserve cannot stop him. He can pull out of these deals and significantly detriment the global economy in the process. Good place to stop? I rest my case. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We appreciate it. That was very good. So we will end the debate with um, two rebuttal speeches, one from each side. We will start 
with the negative. You have five minutes. Go ahead. So I will start my time. I will start my time in three, two, one. Right, U.S. dollar hegemony cannot be considered harmful on balance based on the idea that is linked to the euro dollar or the other specific instances such as the Latin American crisis that affirmative sites. Overall, dollar hegemony has helped the international economy, especially emerging markets, undergo unprecedented growth in spite of brief downturns. The U.S. is a good steward that continues to back the international growth, provide leadership over a rules-based, voluntary, and transparent system that benefits the global community as a whole. First, on leadership. The point is the U.S. works with its allies for problem solving and is not alone in uh, leading the global economy. Of course, the U.S. doesn't agree on everything with its allies. We think that's an unrealistic burden to support, but it is willing to work on with issues, and when those issues arise, it resolves them. There's a unique benefit in the fact that as its position as hegemon and global leader, the U.S. is able to foster unified decision making, which is vital in terms of economic policy. So they bring up this idea of the basket of currencies and implicit and like imply implicitly that this is would this would be the alternative in the absence of dollar hegemony. But the problem is when you have this basket of currencies, you're not going to have a unified response. You're giving other actors on the global stage more power, which at the minimum means that you're going to have far more disagreements. You're going to have clashing ideologies that will inevitably deter or at least slow down the decision making process, which could lead to horrible ramification in terms of actual policy imp implementation because people will continue to suffer while deci the decision is stalled within this organization. For example, if we look at the EU, because it's contained, it, it's made up of many individual nations with their own goals, they constantly clash on policies and therefore find it difficult to have a unified stance on monetary policy. Furthermore, they do not solve their own, like, the problems they cite in this idea of a basket of currencies in the IMF. They bring up um, like connections to other currencies, like the euro dollar. They bring up the idea of loans. But the fact is, all nations will still need the loans, and that like all currencies will fluctuate. How is this different in their world? How do they solve for this? They do not tell you. Furthermore, on that, we believe that the U.S. uniquely provides for global growth per our first intention, and these unique reasons are, uh, show that this is actually the U.S. dollar hegemony is a primary factor, well, maybe not the sole factor, because of, first, the idea that economics is a matter of trust. The use of the dollar every day shows that nations are choosing the dollar. It's a vote for the dollar because of its, uh, because of its benefits. Furthermore, dollar hegemony necessitates U.S. leadership and in organizations like the International, World Bank, uh, in International Monetary Fund, World Bank, et cetera, allowing for coordinated and quick and effective policymaking. And lastly, on size, the U.S. It is still one of the largest economies in the world. No other nation has sufficient liquidity to the same extent of the, of the dollar because it's so widely used. Okay, now let's look at their biggest impact, which they collapse on, which is the idea of like Latin American crisis. This is too specific. It's one instance in the 75 years of dollar hegemony, and they don't tell you how this is directly due to dollar hegemony. What we know is that the U.S. international order stepped in following this crisis. The Fed established swap lines. The IMF provided loans and economic uh, policy reform. The World Bank offered assistance, etc. Argentina, Ecuador, specific cases regarding this crisis, chose the dollar because they're because of hyper inflation and economic instability at home. They chose dollarization because they personally believed it was the best option, despite their disagreements, perhaps, on an ideological level with the United States government. The problem is dollarization failed to work when these nations lost discipline and were unable to continue the reforms that the IMF tried to implement. Regardless, these, the, the aforementioned safety net of international organizations, which is uniquely fostered under U.S. leadership, is what allowed for these nations to recover. Okay, now on currency availability and fluctuations. They don't tell you either how currencies would not appreciate in their world or currencies like uh, would benefit like this idea of appreciation and depreciation, depreciation wouldn't occur, right? We think all currencies are going to occur or fluctuate at one point. The point is the dollar is relatively stable and the fact and, and the fact is that when you have like one dominant currency it allows for liquidity, allows for this um, like promotion of growth because you have one currency, you have enough capital, you can actually buy technology and grow as a developing nation. And on the point about loans, we say that IMF loans are in dollars because of liquidity reasons. Dollars are the most preferable. The IMF is led by the U.S. and other international organizations. Of course, the U.S. is one funder, but it's the largest funder. It gives the most contributions, and this is part of the leadership point that we are trying to make. Other loaning programs are far too predatory, like the BRC, to be relied on.
And lastly, on the point about sanctions, these are non-unique sanctions are necessary to maintain a rules-based system. We say, given the other options of military conflict, this is far more preferable because interventionalism would be bad for the global stage as a whole. And therefore, we need to punish bad actors rather than giving more influence and promote inter uh, international interventionism worldwide. Last thing, euro dollar, they need to show a link. They continue to fail this. Uh -huh. They don't show the massive impacts on the euro dollar as a whole. Thank you. Final affirmative rebuttal. All right. Five minutes. All right. Everybody ready. hear me? Good. All right. Then I will begin now. Judges, let's start off with an overview of the debate. Our thesis is simple. The dollar has created an unsustainable and volatile financial system that multiplies the scale of recessions, creates an over-reliance on the U.S. dollar that can result in debt crises and prevents undue influence of a single actor to devastate local communities and populations through sanctions. The thesis of our response to the NEG is that what's in the interest of the domestic economy is not the same as the global economy. You can see that in the Latin American debt crisis. An over-reliance allows one country to prioritize its domestic economy over the world economy. You see that selfish America first policy in sanctions in Latin America and everywhere else. Now, in the end, Judge, you must ask yourself two questions in order to determine the winner of today's debate. First, what is the true role of the dollar in the world economy? And in these roles, is it more beneficial or harmful? With these questions in mind, let's go to the first key voting issue on the euro dollar. On the euro dollar, realize this is a lack of leadership from the US. The US has no control over the system. And this is important because 90% of dollars transacted internationally are in euro dollars. And 90% of loans denominated are in euro dollars. This is a $14 trillion market and is the most important in this round. They simply have no response. But what Vanderbilt 14 finds is this over-reliance is what causes local recessions to go global. Because the dollar funding gap means that countries cannot sustain uh, dollar funding and leads to the 08 recession pushing 14 million people into poverty. Then on to dollar appreciation. Dollar appreciation ties in with their entire global trade uh, contention as well. As dollar appreciation, realize that the dollar uniquely appreciates and overlines on this single currency instead of diversifying into multiple currencies where you can avoid the effects of, uh, of a single currency appreciating is uniquely what makes the dollar detrimental. This is the same in global trade. You can use other currencies for global trade. The dollar hegemony is what's preventing that. In the end, this is what led to a 30% appreciation of the dollar and the Latin American debt crisis destroying the value of 33 countries and a decade of lost growth. Then onto sanctions. Realize the thesis here is that they enable the US to enact devastating unilateral sanctions that would not happen in the contrary world where multilateral sanctions would be the only way to proceed. Look to the uh, Cuba and to Iran. In both cases, Everybody around the world opposed U.S. sanctions, yes, they enacted them anyway. In Iran, that puts 3.5 million people into poverty, and that's why unilateral sanctions, because of dollar hegemony, are uniquely harmful. Now, let's go on to their side of the flow. Their thesis is kind of other countries choose the dollar, and nobody actually forces them to use the dollar, and that's why the dollar is hegemon, and that's why it's beneficial. The reality is this is because of decades of U.S. institutions to prop up hegemony, which forces countries to over-rely on the dollar. Other countries can't simply overthrow dollar hegemony. Bretton Woods has simply carried over, and these systems that have established dollar hegemony are not equally available to everybody. Other th currencies can be just as good as a dollar, but the hegemon system blocks it. Simply put, there is no choice for other countries. Other countries are forced into this detrimental system. They're forced into be subject to sanctions. They're forced into the subject of dollar appreciation. And they ignore the fact that people are also turning off the dollar. With dollar reserves continuing dropping every year, clearly we see a shift away from dollar hegemony. A multilateral system is where the world is turning. Then let's look at their GDP per capita has grown overall in world trade. Sure, world trade has increased. It's correlation, not causation, because of dollar hegemony. We would argue without the reliance on the dollar that has led to decades of setbacks to emerging markets and wiped out trade during the over recession, the world would have lower poverty rates and better GDP. Look to the Latin American debt crisis, which reversed a decade of growth. In the end, you're wearing a multilateral leader that they're claiming versus the over-reliance on a country that promotes its domestic economy at the expense of the world. 
They have a lack of leadership over 90% of the world economy with euro dollars. They simply do not have leadership over that system. And there's a lack of multilateral cooperation on sanctions. Instead, there has been an over-reliance that has devastated the world economy and is currently shifting towards a diversity of currencies that are able to stabilize the current global economy due to diversity. Multilateral sanctions and multilateral global trade leadership through the IMF and World Bank can still happen without the U.S. dollar as the hegemon that has led to the unique detriments of the Latin American debt crisis and the 08 recession being spread globally and pushing 14 million people into poverty. Thus, we affirm. Congratulations to both teams. We are now going to give the judges a few minutes to complete their ballots, and then we will announce the advancing team, and very quickly thereafter begins semifinal number two. In the debate between Pine Ridgeland High School and Amity Regional High School, Pine Ridgeland High School advances by a 3-0 vote. You'll take part in the... Uh, Pine Richland will take part in the finals at 3.30 today. Amity Regional, congratulations on being a semifinalist in this year's competition. In just a couple minutes, we'll begin semifinal number two. We're going to have to set 